Good evening. My name is Johanna Kolinen and you are watching Crosstalks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Please do join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. If you've been following science and technology news this year, you've heard some of the world's brightest minds expressing serious concern about the development of artificial intelligence technologies. The rise of AI, they say, poses a grave threat to humanity. Others do dismiss these doomsday scenarios as overreactions and uh, focus instead on the many positive and interesting applications of artificial intelligence. Here to discuss the exciting potential of AI research and to assuage our pop cultural fears about robot overlords are Theo Cantor, Professor of Computer Science at the Department of Computer and System Sciences at Stockholm University. Christina Nielsen Björkenstam, PhD, Computational Linguistics, uh, Stockholm University, and Christian Smith, uh, Assistant Professor in Computer Science, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We might as well start by addressing this notion of the danger of AI right away. You're all, you're all working in fields relating to artificial intelligence in different ways. Do you also believe that artificial intelligence is a, th is a threat to humans? Uh, no, I don't believe so, because uh, human mankind is uh, the ultimate tool maker, and uh, so what we are dealing with is uh, really a refined stone axe, uh, and uh, we, uh, we only have to consider where we start to surrender uh, our control to uh, uh, AI-inspired technologies, and uh, I think we, uh, this is in the distant uh, future where we are um, blurring the, um, the boundary between ourselves and the AI. But that said, if we look at the internet today, when we use uh, services like Spotify, where do we sort of do what technology wants us to do? That is the interesting question. So you're saying no, but we're manipulated by machines already? We uh, devise things that change us, yes. Christina, what about you? Um, no, I, I don't worry about AI. I worry about other things. <laughs> no, I'm not worried. Um, but I think that Theo has a point about uh, um, us becoming this, this sort of uh, systems that cater to our interests and mm. to that give us what we want. That mm. might be a problem. Yeah. Mm. What about Christian? Do you agree? So I, <clears throat> I am not, I don't really see the development of, of evil robot overlords as, as such. I don't really see the drive to develop those kinds of systems for, uh, for one thing. But I do think there are lots of things that should concern us in the development of uh, artificial systems and, and more advanced technology overall. Um, technological advances of any kind will have effects on society. It's going to change the labor market, it's going to have effects on the economy and the way of our, we lead our social lives and, and, and uh, so on. And I, I think we have to be aware of what kind of changes there are and, and sort of drive this sort of development in, in the direction that we really want it to take. So what are some of these realistic changes that, that we think these technologies are about to bring about? So uh, something which has been uh, mentioned a lot in the media lately is that there's a large portion of jobs that exist today that can probably be automated and be done more efficiently with different kinds of machines and computer software. And the people who are currently doing those jobs, of course, uh, could see this as, uh, as a threat. And society, of course, has to be, be aware of these things. We, we have, we're talking about, for instance, autonomous driving is going to mean that uh, it might not be uh, a realistic future now to educate yourself to become a chauffeur, to drive a taxi or, or, or a large truck, because those jobs will not uh, survive in the long term. There are other jobs such as maybe in, 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 in a further future, uh, medical diagnostics might be done by, by artificial intelligence mm -hmm. instead and so on. Yes, uh, to return to your question about the overlords, I think uh, there is something to, say, to be said in addition to what uh, Christian said uh, in uh, important points is that 
uh, when you see the use of uh, advisory systems, expert systems uh, like um, uh, Watson developed by IB IBM and Which expert system. Which is a system. sort of diagnostic system it's for doctors. It's a diagnostic yeah. system and it uh, recommends answers and when these are be, uh, being used by policy makers then you see um, a convergence towards uh, um, uh, types of behavior that uh, can uh, worry us. Um, I would like to remind that for instance in the 19s expert systems were used by brokers to uh, uh, to respond to stock uh, exchanges um, uh, developments and then uh, this um, led to um, um, well a downfall of um, uh, these um, uh, a crisis. I'm realizing now we're talking about almost every kind of technology imaginable. Is there a definition for artificial intelligence? Uh, yes, it's uh, basically about uh, behavior embodied by machines and software. That is the short uh, definition. I'm not sure I understand that. Is there a longer definition? That is yes, uh, there are two things. One is that we try to mimic uh, the operation of the mind, uh, which mm -hmm. we do not understand. And thus we devised uh, tests like Turing tests in order to compare the human to a machine. Uh, on the other hand, there is also another definition. Intelligence is uh, basically operational knowledge uh, used by the military, state, uh, government, and uh, so intelligence is also about information. So mind and information. Intelligence and so on. And to, uh, I'm just going to finish this whole overlord track of thought here. We're not necessarily talking about self-aware machines. Uh, we uh, uh, might see them in the uh, distant future, but then again, I, uh, I think we have um, uh, we can mimic this behavior, but we don't understand awareness as yet, as in the human brain projects. Uh, we are not there yet, but maybe Christina has an opinion about how much we understand language. Well, um, we don't understand language. <laughs> we, d we don't really know um, how we process language. We're still finding it out, and uh, so... Yeah, I think we have some more work to do. Yeah. I mean, let's start with Christian. You work with robots in human yeah. environments, human-centered environments, yes. basically. Can you tell us some examples of what this means? So human-centric environment is, is, is an environment that's built for humans. Uh, as an example, I, uh, a trivial example would be your own home. Mm -hmm. If you have a robot that helps you in your home, that would be a robot in a human-centered environment. But we're also talking about smaller industries. If you have a small manufacturing industry, which has been originally, des originally designed for human workers, and you want to replace uh, or, or sort of extend, expand this by adding robot workers into that, those robots will be working in a human work environment. With humans? With humans. Always. And that has, of course, lots of requirements on the robots that are not present in a typical, purely automated environment like a modern car factory would be. So what sort of challenges does this entail? So one of the things is that um, robots have uh, problems understanding their environment. If I show something to a robot it has never seen before, of course it has no idea how to pick it up, how to use it, how to work with it. Uh, and we still have a lot of work to do in research on how to get a robot to understand something, like this bottle of water right here. Mm. And how would I, would I pour water into a glass? I can, of course, program a robot to pick up this specific uh, bottle and pour water into this specific glass but it might not be able to use that knowledge in order to pour gasoline from, from, a, from a gasoline container into a car, even though it's basically the same kind of action. Because we cannot yet get robots or artificial intelligence to generalize those kind of things. And in a human environment, we don't want, in your home, you don't want to have only one kind of bottle, which is the government sort of issued bottle, which is the only one you're allowed to have, because that's the one that robots understand, right? You yeah. want to design your home yourself. And that's a human-centric environment. So it's made for you and for your needs. And to get the robot to operate in there is a very difficult problem. How far away are we from robots being able to process categories like that? To, to look at something and say, this is probably a bottle and therefore. So processing what it is is, is something where we have seen lots of progress in, in, in recent years. You show. Um, a photograph of something to a computer program when you use something called convolutional neural networks. Uh, it's been uh, branded as deep learning, which is, is the term uh, used a lot. Mm -hmm. And 
you see quite good results for, for at least for some categories, at least as good as humans. It's shown a picture of a cat and you can tell that this is a cat. Mm. It's a completely different thing to see a picture of a bottle and to understand what you can do with it. I can pour water from the bottle, I can pour water into the bottle, I can get in a bar fight and hit you over the head with the bottle. There are lots of different uses of a bottle. And not all of these are obvious just from the class itself. Yeah. Christina, one of the most challenging things for machine intelligence to understand and process, I would assume, is human language. And, and this connects, I mean, if you put robots in human environments, everybody always speaks of care for the elderly. So let's think about that. If my, my grandmother would have a robot in her home, I think she would need to be able to speak to it with mm. language. This also is quite far away, I'm assuming. And this is your field, right? Yes. My understanding is, as a computational linguist, w among other things, you're learning, uh, you're researching how children learn languages in order to create computer models of this process. So what are some of the things you have learned? And also baked into this, I guess, is what you were already implying. We don't know how children learn language. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we, we don't really know. We don't so, have so the definite answer. So what are we learning answer. now? We're learning now. What we're trying to uh, model the child and the parent in a home-like environment with objects and how the parent and the child interact uh, around language. And I think that um, even though my project isn't geared towards artificial intelligence, but I think that we, we learn a lot from this natural interaction between parents and children. Uh, we see really interesting sort of coaching strategies that the parents use to get the child to do what they want to do. Uh, and we see other types of strat strategies from, from the child's perspective uh, on how to figure out what this water bottle is and what you can do with it. And uh, we're looking at them just playing, but there are other scenarios as well that would be interesting. And I think that some of these strategies, if we can sort of use them um, within artificial intelligence, that would, that would be interesting. So let's see, what kinds of things are we talking about? What, what, what would a, a strategy for a, st a parent be? A typical strategy is that the parent wants the child to do something, mm -hmm. and then they give the child a the message. They say what they want them to do, like pick up the ball. Mm -hmm. And then they want some, so, some sort of confirmation from the child that the child has listened and understood, and hopefully they will do what the parent tells them to do. And if the child doesn't do it, then the parent will just repeat the same message. But the form of the message won't be the same. So there's variation. The parent will repeat the same message, but in different form, until the child actually performs this action. And I think that kind of, if we can trigger that kind of behavior in humans, uh, then that would give very good data to a learning system. But then part of that is also about things like sight lines. So I'll be looking at the ball in a yes. meaningful manner and yes. saying many, many words. Does yes. the, so the child retroactively, when, once they figure it out, do they retroactively learn many of the words that I've used? They learn to connect it to the ball, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and children use all these different types of signals. And we can see that uh, the, the parent uses a lot of multimodal extra information for the child, like eye gaze. And um, it's really, uh, language learning is a lot about um, learning to interpret the intention of the other person and to understand what the other person might want me to do. And that kind of, that kind of building of some sort of yeah. But is that why machines can't do it? Because one always imagines that part of this is just a vocabulary problem. So if mm. you just gave the child a complete vocabulary, this, would, this problem wouldn't exist. But we could give a machine all the words and all the sounds and say, go, talk, yes. understand. But, but that the there are many problems. So one of the, the major problems about language is that words have more than one meaning. Oh, yeah. And if you combine words, then those combined words have more than one meaning. And if you combine a lot of words into a sentence, then you have many, many different interpretations. But for a human, those, interpre those different interpretations might not even be, they're not, you know, they doesn't make sense. So you don't, you just ignore them and you only have one interpretation. But for somebody learning a language, that's not obvious. And so on the one hand, you have that problem that you have many different possible analysis of one sentence. And also it seems that humans, well, we, we do some kind of maybe statistical processing based on data that we've heard before. 
But we also do other types of reasoning, common sense reasoning. We know things about the world. We know things about the experience yeah. of being a yeah. human. We know that if we pour water, the floor will get wet. We know yeah. all of these things and that, that, you know, we need that to reason about language and to understand language. Christian. Yeah, you know, you, you definitely like the, the context and, and that is something we see with robots uh, as compared. So we, uh, there's lots of language processing and dialogue systems done completely on computers that have no body, you just have like a microphone and a speaker. And we do with a robot instead and we get different results. An example in a study we did in Japan, we were talking about this and that as two words. So I have this glass, and over there we have that glass, or those glasses. But ge geometrically speaking, where is the line, where's the boundary line where a glass stops being this glass and starts becoming that glass? If oh I yeah. tell you to pick up that glass, which glass is that, right? Yeah, this yeah, is a and very we can spatial we decide. We, uh, if I say this glass, then we've established that that's this glass, and now that is that glass. Yes, so we, we, ha we have mm -hmm. an agreement. And, and, and that can be communicated in what we're looking at and our body language and our pose and our gestures. And there's also a specific situation. If there are two glasses, typically the glass closer to me is this and the one closer to you might be that from, 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 from my viewpoint. But a pair of glasses closer to me, the further glass is going to be basically closer to me than the closer glass was to you, if this makes any sense. Yeah. And, and, and then the fur in, in the one case, the glass which is actually further away becomes this in one context, but it's that in another context. So this and that was, will then point to completely different glasses just because of our spatial context when we're reasoning about So them. if we could break down this, these kinds of things into rule sets, which I'm assuming is what we're ultimately doing, what what's the potential? What, what are the most exciting possibilities in language processing? Everybody gets to answer if it's relevant to your fields. Mm -hmm. Christina? Mm -hmm. Well, to me, I, the most... It would be really wonderful to be able to use natural language as the interface with machines. I mean, that is just, that, that would be a very good thing, I think, for, for lots of people with different abilities. And if you have some kind of disability, then you might need to use mm -hmm. uh, this very natural way of expressing ourselves. Please we're talking about natural ways of expressing yourself. In, in our research, research, we're actually trying to move even away from language as in spoken or wit written language and talk about body language. Mm. And, and body language is not only about posture and, and, and communicating like I'm dominating or I'm sort of scared, but there's even very specific body language. If I uh, would hand you this glass, for instance, the way that I reach over to someone communicates my intention of when to do it and where to, 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 to place the glass. And somebody is going to accept that glass. And I don't have to tell you, I'm going to give you this glass approximately 30 centimeters in front of you at a height of <laughs> 72 <laughs> centimeters. In front. I don't need to give that information. I can show that just by the motion. If we carry something together, if, if we're moving house, right, yeah, and I yeah. help you carry a table, and we carry each, each part of it, I say, okay, you take that side, I take this side, and we start moving. I don't have to instruct you at every single turn and corner. I can basically just push a bit, or you can see my motion, and you can follow it. I see. Right? Yes, I see. So there's I see. lots so of, of course, communication, yeah. even in the way we move, the way we push things, the way we pull things. The, w the way we stand, and where am I? In a future where everything is going to be more and more automated, we're going to want our clothes and our house, and these kinds of, mm. we're going to want this kind of thing to be communicated. Yes, yes. because as you well. don't. Yeah. But is that is under the assumption that uh, we're in such an environment that we wish to discuss things with machines. Uh, there could be gestures, of course, mm -hmm. uh, as in game environments. Uh, there could be other ways to interact with uh, intelligence, of course. But I think um, yeah, there are definitely, uh, definitely a lot of situations where natural speech, what mm -hmm. our intentions are, uh, are very important. And, um, but I think there are also other uh, ways to interact with uh, intelligence uh, that um, we're probably not perceiving as artificial intelligence in the same way. Yeah, your research uh, involves distributed systems and moving intelligence out on the internet. And already here, I, I realize I don't quite understand. So uh, I know that you work uh, yeah. with a project where you're trying to optimize, optimize how people move in traffic systems. Uh, how is this related to artificial intelligence? Yes, basically what you can view it as ambient intelligence. So it means that um, you, you interconnect things in a, in a in a total solution, and we're talking about here tomorrow's uh, traffic, where, for instance, uh, Christian's uh, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles 
uh, people, uh, but even now uh, everything can be connected. You and I can be connected and uh, all the participants here in the social network that wish to commute to this uh, session and we want to do it in an optimal way. We want to use uh, our common resources in traffic. We want to use uh, public transport, our mm -hmm. vehicles, and we want to uh, wish our um, trip to be as pleasant as possible, so optimize. And we wish also to optimize the resource uh, usage in the system such that the energy uh, footprint is minimal because we waste uh, resources uh, the way we commute. And so all the pieces in this, uh, our cars, uh, we ourselves, the things in a public uh, mm. transport system have to opt, um, behave optimally. Yeah. And uh, they have to cooperate in order to uh, bring about our, uh, our journey. And this is a, a kind of intelligence that adapts to us, our preferences. And this is a very different type of intelligence, ambient intelligence in uh, cooperative systems. So what we do is try to look at how to enable these pieces to be aware of the others and to uh, adjust uh, the, uh, their behavior. Yeah. That is uh, that's fascinating, and and this idea because of course I immediately thought of like a big traffic mastermind, but that's not it. Again, it's it's distributing it uh, out. Yeah, you can uh, compare it to an ant hill uh, mm. where uh, all the ants have no clue what they are doing together, but uh, still the result is good. Joining us now on Skype from Switzerland uh, is Jürgen Schmidhuber, Professor in Artificial Intelligence and Scientific Director at the Swiss, Swiss AI Lab, IDSIA. Uh, welcome to Crosstalks. My pleasure. Uh, I, I have heard that your scientific ambition, since you were a teen, has been to build the optimal scientist through self-improving AI and then retire. How close are you today to this goal, or are we as a species to that goal, and what are the biggest challenges remaining? Mm -hmm. So this ties actually in to some of the things I just heard from my colleagues in this discussion. We already do have uh, rudimentary artificial scientists, and maybe I should mention that all the stuff that we are doing here in my research group is about learning from scratch to understand the world and then use the understanding of the world to achieve goals and all the stuff that we are doing here or most of it is really uh, based on artificial neural networks uh, recurrent networks that can process not only images like those mentioned by um, my colleagues before but the really sequences of images videos and then we are talking about agents that interact with the world uh, babies or scientists or other agents who are trying to uh, to conduct experiments in the real world and then see what is the outcome and then learn from that how to predict these outcomes, which can all be done by a so-called recurrent neural network, which over time uh, learns to, to become a predictor of the future, given the past inputs, the past history of observations and actions. And over time, it learns to become better and better at doing that. And then there's the, the other guy, the controller, the one that is actually uh, generating the actions that shape the in input history because if I'm looking here and not there then I'm seeing something that is different from what I would see over there and mm. so on so that's the way how through our actions we all the time shape our history now the, the big question for uh, not only the optimal scientist but also for a little baby is what should I do next to get some interesting input and there's this formal theory of uh, curiosity and creativity, which essentially says what you should do next is perform an experiment or an action sequence that leads to more data that has an unknown regularity, something regular which I didn't know yet. Mm. Many of the inputs from the environment are hard to predict. They are noisy. You can't really predict the details. However, many of these inputs also are full of regularities. For example, the sun goes up uh, every day, a little baby moves its fingers like that, and then can um, uh, create uh, a regular impression, a rhythmic uh, feeling in the fingers. And 
in the beginning, before the baby knows anything about the world, this is still interesting, this is still novel, then it incorporates that and the whole thing becomes boring. Now the, 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 the baby is trying to come up with new action sequences that expand its knowledge about That's the world. That's wonderful. Get... Does this mean, though, that you have robots? You said you have rudimentary artificial scientists. Do, oh, yeah. Does it mean that you have robots in the laboratory that are behaving like babies? Yeah, trying yeah, things and fall. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and they start over. out from nothing. They start from scratch, and then over time, <laughs> they come up with um, discoveries of new regularities in the environment that they didn't know yet, and they incorporate them into their little brains made of um, artificial neurons that are recurrently connected, such that their brains actually become general computers. And the the big issue is how to find connection weights strengths of these connections between these different yeah. um, neurons such that the, the baby or this baby robot that we have over time learns more and more about how to interact with the world, how to achieve consequences that are useful for the baby that lead to desirable states such as not too hot, not too cold, <laughs> don't bump against an, ob uh, an obstacle which causes pain, so pain is an undesired input. Um, and that researcher parents don't low. come in and, and tell you that you're being bad, which I guess is a factor also. Um, yeah. This That's is, this is a, very exciting. We have a, pro, a comment from, from Theo Cantor. Yes, I'm, uh, I think this is a really found, uh, fascinating and promising research, uh, clearly. Uh, my question is, since I work with the Internet of Things, and uh, that uh, all this work is, of course, using uh, sensing of the environment in some sense, and um, how much uh, information from uh, distributed sensor networks uh, could you use and and uh, make useful uh, use of in your in your research? Uh, what is sort of the uh, the scope of of this? Um, how much input can you deal with? Mm. Yeah, the the answer is the scope is in principle unlimited. The nature of the sensors is unlimited. We can deal with speech, we can deal with vision, we can deal with tactile inputs, and we feed it all into the same type of system, which is a big recurrent neural network, which can then learn to take all these different sensor modalities, including those that are not known to man, like, for example, radar sensor inputs and LIDAR sensor inputs and whatever, um, and then uh, cross-correlate them and figure out how the, are they related and then in the end produce actions that lead to desirable goals. And in fact, at least in the pattern recognition domain, which is easier than this action perception, action perception cycle, where it's just the goal to recognize patterns such as speech or videos or so, in some of these uh, domains our neural networks already can achieve human competitive performance, sometimes even superhuman performance. And, um, and the big companies, Google and Microsoft and IBM, they are all using our recurrent neural networks now to, to um, improve speech recognition, video recognition, image caption uh, um, generation. Uh, one of my colleagues has um, mm -hmm. a while ago mentioned images that are being uh, handled or being analyzed by something called convolutional networks. But on top of that, then it's one of our LSTM recurrent networks that generates out of that um, a natural language, a string. For example, it says, it looks at an, at an image and then it says, um, a herd of elephants walking across dry grass in front of a forest. <laughs> and you look at the image and, and yes, that's true, that's it, that's what you see on the image. And this is just achieved by putting lots of data, lots of images, which which are labeled by some captions, and then uh, from there the, the recurrent network learns to produce not always perfect, but pretty reasonable captions from many of these images, learning yeah. that from scratch. Uh, Professor Schmidt you're yeah, I know you're also very interested in art, culture, creativity. Do you think machines can learn to understand art or, or to be creative. I'm, I'm not yes. sure what that would mean. Do you think this will be possible in the future? Yes, it's very simple to uh, build that because that uh, again goes back to the previous answer. Suppose you have a system consisting of two modules. One is the controller and the other one is the world model. Both of them learn over time to become better modules in the sense that the world model 
better and better predicts uh, the next inputs given the previous history of actions and inputs and the controller um, experiences a moment of joy whenever the um, world model makes progress in the sense that it can encode the same observation sequence with less computational resources than before, such that at some, uh, at some point before the insight, it needs uh, so many synapses and neurons to encode the observations, and suddenly it sees a regularity which allows it to, um, to compress the whole thing such that it needs only um, so many fewer um, resources, first so many, then afterwards so many. And the difference between before and after, that's proportional to a little joy signal, an intrinsic reward, a, a wow effect, an insight. And this is just a real number. I can measure it. I can measure it and give it to the other guy, the controller, which is trying to maximize it using some standard uh, maximization algorithm, which is trying to maximize these joy signals, the sum, the cumulative sum of all these joy signals. And voila, I have a, an artificial creative um, artist or scientist who is always motivated to come up with even additional action sequences, experiments, if you will, that lead to additional data that has the property that it's non-trivial, that there is some regularity, some structure in it, which it didn't know, but which it can learn, which its world model can learn, mm. such that afterwards it knows more about the regularities than before. And so for this fleeting moment, yeah. then, it has another joy signal. I, so I, I wonder the about the definition of art, but it, it's a lovely image, the idea of this joyful machine. Christian? So I would just like to add to this. Uh, I mean, I think it's wonderful to have both an artificial artist and an artificial art critic because then you have sort of completely rationalized away the need for a human at all in the process. Um, but I, I would also like to add that I, I see it's um, completely possible to replace one of these um, machines or comp uh, computer programs, if you wish, with a human. So you can have a human who basically tells the machine that, oh, I like this thing and I don't like that, uh, and it can keep generating. So this is also used, for instance, in computer games. So some very popular computer games that you can get as apps to your phones will generate different kinds of difficulty levels that you're playing. And when you generate a level which is too difficult, and you see that the number of users who actually play this level goes down, then they will tweak some numbers and make the level a slight bit easier. And you see that the user numbers go up again, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes you see that it, the level is too easy and people drop off and they won't play the game. So you have these sort of like automated feedbacks where you sort of generate games which are just easy enough for people to enjoy. And if you as I do at least, I think games is one art form, mm. then you already have basically automated generators of, of art that see as a measurement of the number of consumers as, as, as a feedback signal to, to the, sort of the, the, the critique of the art that, art that you're generating. It, it, then that, that does reduce it to popular art form, but I, I see what you mean. Yeah, the principle should be yeah. the same. Yeah, absolutely, Theo. Yes, yeah, so regarding... Yeah, just a moment. Let me say one thing here quickly. Very so quickly. the difference between this very interesting approach that was just outlined uh, and, and what I said before is, of course, in one case, in the latter case, there is this external environment, the social environment, which provides a feedback, which acts like a teacher. It says, mm -hmm. this was good, this was not so good, this was good, this was good. And so from that, external signals the system can learn. In that sense, it is externally guided. And there are lots of algorithms that um, can be used to, to implement that guidance into better performance, into better actions. Mm -hmm. However, when there's no external guidance like that, then another big question is um, what is interesting in absence of this external guidance? Yeah. What should my little creative system do when there's no external guy who tells it what to do? And then the, then the question is who does it become in a way? Theo Kenton. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, connecting it to one of our projects which is uh, using uh, not neural networks but uh, sensing to uh, provide uh, care in the home in uh, collaboration. Uh, this sensing is then tying in also social networks uh, with uh, significant others, friends and families and professional care. But then if you would add this functionality to have a personal assistant, if you will, who adds behavior to this uh, local environment, then uh, what would the... Um, yeah, this uh, could uh, then uh, be uh, provide a very uh, interesting environment for an elderly who uh, provides uh, it would provide guidance and it mm -hmm. could be uh, then adapt not only as in our case um, safe um, uh, to provide a, 
uh, well-being in terms of detecting that you haven't fallen or something like that, but also guidance, how to live your life, take your medicine yeah. and so forth. So this, uh, this would be, on the, be then the interactive situation that we're looking at. Christina, you told us that you're interested in incorporating humanoid robots in, into practical research situations when you're researching how children learn language. Uh, what are you envisioning there? Oh, it would be really interesting um, to bring a baby robot into my home. I would like to see how uh, a baby interacts with siblings, for example, because typically the situation that we uh, use in our research is we, we try to simplify everything. So there's only one parent and there's one child and, and nothing else. But that would be interesting to see how other children help uh, a small child to learn because we know that siblings and other children are very important for language learning so that would be one thing and um it's also because uh it's just not ethical to to experiment with babies uh in ways that we might be able to do with uh, with robots so that that would be a dream but it's not something that we're actively pursuing but there are some very interesting but surely there are possibilities christian we must mm. be able to make this happen somehow to bring a baby robot into a home environment. So, it, well, it depends on, on, on your definitions of the baby robot. So, there are, of course, um, <laughs> the robots that are basically the size uh, of a baby, and, and, and babies are not very high performance in terms of, of mecha uh, mechanisms and so on. So, we can definitely create a robot that has basically the same performance as a baby, as long as you keep it as a, a, a young enough baby. The problem is you want to give it the same behavior. Mm -hmm. And since we don't really understand exactly um, all the nature of the behavior of the baby, uh, this is a slightly difficult problem. I mean, you would be studying the robot rather than this, uh, yes, studying, uh, studying the baby. So th that, that would be a difficult situation. If you're looking into interactions, on the other hand, we can view uh, a baby or a child uh, as sort of like a black box system. We have no idea how it works <laughs> on the inside, but as, as long as the actions on the outside are sort of similar, we're happy. If you place a system like that, which might be easier to desi design, there are different ways to do it. It could be remote controlled by another person, if not nothing else. And you place that with a baby, and then you can see what's the interaction between the real baby and the robot baby. And I think you can have lots of, lots of uh, interesting results from that. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, Professor schmidt Huber, did you want to come in? Um, no, not really. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so if, yeah. you, um, if you ask me like that, I always can start going, but I will <laughs> start off in, a, in another direction, and so... <laughs> Very good. Theo, you... you, 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 make, you thank should you. make the next step. Very good. Theo, you've told us that you think that big data and the internet in itself is a foreign intelligence that we have yet to fully understand. Uh, Did I say this sounds... No, no, Theo has. This sounds ter terrifying to me. Yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> basically because uh, we can do anything in the cloud uh, with algorithms. And uh, we will have, through the inter Internet of Things, access to vast amounts of data that in real time monitor uh, any uh, sensor on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the type of research that we are doing. And we're pumping this, all this data in, into the cloud. And, uh, well, uh, first of all, we have no control of our data, what we surrender to, these, uh, uh, to this cloud. And uh, what the result is that we are able to predict, as we heard before, not only with neural networks locally, but also uh, on a global scale, uh, predict uh, and to foresee what we're going to say. So uh, I'm expecting uh, soon services that will predict what I'm going to say the next minute. And then uh, they're already predicting who I should acquaint myself with on LinkedIn. Uh, they know my music tastes uh, before I've been even told Spotify. And uh, this is going to continue. And it means that uh, we're looking at some ambient intelligence that uh, sort of uh, taps into my mind and extracts uh, what uh, my, my wishes are. And suddenly I'm, I'm confronted by not being in control anymore. And that is the alien part. Yeah, and certainly I, I guess it, uh, even if, even if uh, I mean, this becomes terrifying because it's personal, right? But even if, if a computer is a learning system only had access to all of our cultural information as a culture, the, the, they could still become better at manipulating us, for instance, for 
for, I don't know, military or advertising purposes or so Cle on? Clearly, but uh, this is already happening and this is what we uh, also uh, wish for. Uh, it's sort of uh, the sorcerer's apprentice uh, and uh, we're alone with his broom and uh, it, it's playing with us and we want service so we are surrendering our data because otherwise we won't get service mm. and we need it because we can't uh, otherwise automate, uh, automate and this is uh, vital. Yeah. That's very right, correct. Let's take some questions from the audience. Who has something on their mind? Please raise your hand. Yes, you can go down to the podium and uh, say your name and your academic affiliation if you have one. And uh, here we are. Oh, it's very good. Yes. So state your name, please. So hi, everybody. My name is Aurélie, and I would like to know why this obsession for performance? I mean, it's like we are all selling our bodies for the science. And I don't understand because I think we are all talking about like those robots, those implants are something really positive. We are all fascinated. But what about the negative aspects? Very what, good. Where are the limits? I mean. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you for your question. So, so is there a, an, an obsession with, with everything becoming better? And I think a side effect of this is, uh, is if we create systems that are op optimized in every way, doesn't that make being human somehow not quite good enough? It, uh, um, um, we discussed this uh, before, and I think we can use it in two ways. Uh, and uh, one positive way is saving the planet because uh, we can have a meta much a smarter way of living. Um, but we can, uh, of course, uh, use it in a bad way. It's um, like every tool that we have. So I would say uh, also uh, add a comment in, in general for, for any kind of um, sort of like developments and, and progress in technology. Uh, at many different points in time in history, people have been worried about the next step in technology, but nobody has been willing to let go of the last step, right? So things that are developed 10 years ago, most people in this room would never be willing to let them go, but there are things that might be developed in the next 10 years that you're afraid of, or do you think you don't to want? To be fair, not everything we've developed has been to our benefit. No, I, 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 I will agree to that. I will agree, mm. agree to that, not everything. But a lot of the things that have been developed, and there has been a trend in history to sort of put the stop here, right? I think that we have reached optimum right now. We don't have to do all that scary stuff in the future. I but see, we are not yeah. willing to let go of whatever happened in the last 10 or 20 years, with a few exceptions, of course. Uh, and when you talk to somebody 100 years ago, they're going to be very afraid of the technology which is going to be promised in 10 years in the future from them, and they will be nostalgic about the robot overlords. Yes, yes, of mm. course. Thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, and yes, next question, please. State your name and ask your question. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Daniel. I'm uh, currently a student at the History of Ideas. Yes. And my question is, uh, with the limits of today's binary computer system, um, does the development of uh, self-aware AI lie within quantum computing? Mm. And also, second question, uh, is the problem a hardware or a software problem? Okay, yeah. that's, let's do that in, in the <laughs> remaining few minutes. Let's, yeah. let's just develop self-aware AI. I'm not mocking a question, by the way. It's a very good question. Where's the problem with creating a self-aware AI? Well, uh, we're um, uh, close uh, to um, having self-aware systems. Uh, if you look at the hardware, uh, IBM uh, just launched uh, their uh, parallel hardware. It's going to be used uh, in UAVs. Uh, unmanned uh, um, aerial okay. vehicles and uh, so you can have a swarm uh, of uh, these um, aircraft uh, performing a task and um, this is uh, very interesting um, I lost track of the second question that was about software yes this is the hardware and or software problem and, and is it, it is going basically to be about a software problem because uh, we have no clue what is really in our minds so in order to uh, really capture language, uh, how to handle a bottle, we have to model the world and, and let it interact also with the world. I dodged this before. I was trying to, let, to not go into this, but let's go into this. Christina, do you think that being self-aware, is that, is that it, does it, re it requires language, perhaps, or some 
some kind of oh, dust. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that, that was a big claim. What a good question. Um, I, I have a hard, but I'm a linguist. I have a hard time imagining uh, that without language, yes. But I don't know. Yeah, I think Please you get sir. a bias because the only self-aware system that we're even starting to get some sort of understanding of is ourselves. I'm not saying claiming that we do understand ourselves, but it would be even more difficult to imagine, given that we don't have a complete understanding of ourselves, to understand a completely different self-aware system that which, is not, which is nothing like us. So I would just say that even if it's possible to have self-awareness without any language or any of the kind of things that we attribute to ourselves, I think it's very, very difficult uh, to imagine it. And since we don't have any good definitions of what actually is awareness. I mean, there's no consensus on what that is. It's very difficult to answer how do we build it. Yes. Uh, I guess it goes back to some kind of, I think, therefore I am level. So yes. it becomes quite banal because then, of course, if it were that easy, we would have solved it already. Do you have an opinion on the quantum computing uh, aspect of the question? Yeah, that is uh, certainly uh, on the roadmap, but it's very hard to predict. Uh, how successful development of these uh, processes will be. Yeah. That is... Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't think we're limited, especially if you look into the, the cloud and internet type of things. I don't think the hardware is the limiting factor uh, for the moment. Do we have a, a, another question from the audience? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Uh, in that case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take another big step, which I was kind of saying, maybe we don't go there. Maybe we will go there. So Ray Kurzweil has predicted that the so-called singularity will happen no. in 2045. I don't know if you're sighing or nodding, so I'll just finish the question. This, <laughs> uh, the singularity would be the time when technology is so advanced that we will be able to simulate human intelligence and consciousness uh, so well that hu a human and machine consciousness could merge. And, and people are interested in this uh, for the purpose, for instance, to be able to upload their minds and live eternally and, and, and so on. Uh, but, but even if we just limit this so, sort of to being able to simulate human consciousness entirely, do you think this is something that's going to happen and 2045 is potentially in our lifetimes? Is this a realistic projection? Mm. Professor schmidt -Huber. So le let me uh, first uh, state that uh, this is not um, the widely accepted um, <laughs> idea of a singularity. Mm -hmm. the, the whole concept goes back to Stanislav Ulam in the 50s, who in certain discussions with von Neumann came up with the observation that history seems to uh, run faster and faster, technical, technological progress seems to accelerate, and uh, it looks as if within finite time, like an exponential uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. series this is going to converge so that's when he came up with this idea of a singularity and the guy who popularized it was in the 1980s Werner Vinge a mathematician who also became a science fiction author and mm -hmm. it was in his science fiction novels that he talked a lot about this technological sing singularity a moment in time where technological progress gets faster and faster um, in shorter and shorter um, and, and, and breakthroughs come quick, more quickly and more quickly all the time, such that the intervals between the major steps, they, um, they shrink exponentially, which means the whole thing converges in finite time. A particular interpretation of that, that you put forth there, that that's the moment when uh, human and computer uh, minds uh, merge, that is just um, one little... Um, uh, particular interpretation. Which I is accept not this. I accept this. But excellent. with the lived experience, it does yeah. seem that we are uh, that technological breakthroughs are accelerating. So, isn't doesn't this support the original idea that singularity could in fact happen in our lifetime, no matter how you define it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, I have no doubt that something like that is going to happen within the few decades, a moment in time where humans will not really be able to follow anymore what's going on and will not be the main decision makers anymore. Time will not stop, of course, it will continue as always, physical time. However, there will be um, some sort of some sort of rupture in, in human history which has been dominated by humans for uh, at least 40,000 years, maybe longer than that. So the, the major uh, chapters in the history books of humankind, they accelerate in ex exactly in a pattern that seems <laughs> 
indicate that there's a convergence point in the near future. And of course, many people have related that then mm -hmm. to the fact that um, every 100, every uh, 10 years, we get a, a, a factor of 100 in terms of computational power per um, Swedish krona. That's excellent. Thank you, Professor. I, th I think this is a wonderful and also slightly terrifying note to end on. Within our lifetime, we are approaching, because of the pace of technological advancement, a rupture in human history. Uh, I guess, again, since we're, we're addressing tonight uh, primarily graduate students and, and people who are, are picking paths for their research careers, this is a good field to be in right now. I guess that's where we're going to end. Any final, final words from yes. the studio, Theo? Uh, I think what we're going to develop in light of this discussion is sort of an, an outer uh, layer of the brain, but it will be artificial and uh, we can sort of as a smartphone today, we can just add it to us and it will be make, uh, make us more efficient and hook us up to uh, um, some global intelligence that we can put to our use. Wonderful. Yes. Any other final words, Christina? Well, I think we have some more work to do. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not quite there yet. We're not quite there. Thankfully, yet. <laughs> Christian. Yeah, yeah, no, like, like, like you're saying, um, it might be observed as a natural law, uh, accelerated development, but of course it's carried out by people. So, I mean, uh, people who are grad students now will be part of, of accelerating that process and so on. And, and I think that can lead to very interesting times, at least in. in in the foreseeable future. And certainly, I guess, in the academic uh, reality also, the unforeseeable paths of funding will be able to slow it down in very <laughs> predictable <laughs> manners. Thank you very much, all. This has been an exciting conversation, uh, but now we are at the end of the show. I will let you all return uh, to your fascinating work. Thank you, Jürgen Schmidt, Huber, Christian Smith, Christina Nielsen Birkenstam, and Theo Cantor. Crosstalks will be back in a month with more great minds and intelligent discussions. Be sure to check in at crosstalks.tv for updates on topics and guests. And for now, be safe and be brave.